WCRF, it is 7.08 on a follow-up Friday. Uh, what do you want to talk about? 440-546-2255. Uh, no surprise to me, we've already had a couple of folks reach out and say they'd like us to kind of digest issue one and the results of issue one from the recent election. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came prepared to do such things because I figured that would be something we ought to talk about. Uh, now, I just I want to remind folks that we are nonpartisan. Right. And so we're not interested at all in discussing what party's right or wrong. But this is a when it comes to human life, there's a it's a biblical moral issue. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is di digest results, and Lord willing, what our plan would be is to kind of digest a now what, mm -hmm. and analyze what happened, and then try to be productive in some measure. But let let me start with this one, and this is a I talked with my mentor about this just a couple of days ago. We cannot forget the reality of God's sovereignty. Amen. It's not a small thing. Like nothing happens where God goes, oh man, I forgot about that. <laughs> or something happens, he goes, whoops, oh, <laughs> it's not what I wanted. Yeah. Now, it may not be easy for us to understand as followers of Christ, but the outcome of any election that's ever happened, including August and now this last week, mm -hmm. God knew the outcome and ordained it. Doesn't mean you like it per se, you know, okay, but we must acknowledge God's sovereignty in this. And therefore, in some measure, we have to accept and go, what's God's invitation here? Like, he's not expecting that we're all going to start doubting his existence. I mean, in some measure, we have to yield mm -hmm. to his sovereign outcome. I mean, uh, but this is a hard thing to do. You're, right. you're agreeing, though, Ron. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm thinking of uh, in the time of the uh, the New Testament writings, uh, the Roman government at that time was very harsh and often um, really uh, uh, anti-Christian, and so they they wrote things like "Count it all joy when you're persecuted for your faith." And for them, the persecution wasn't like, oh, you, you lost at the election. No, it was like physical damage or death. And so God, God knew that was going to happen just as he knew this was going to happen. I would also say that many people came in expecting him to overthrow the Roman government and, right. and its control of, Jer of Jerusalem and Israel itself. He didn't do that. And by the way, who did he annoy the most? The religious people. Yeah. So I would just say if you're feeling exceptionally downtrodden after the results of the election, you ought to spend some time with the Lord on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, d disappointment is a normal human emotion. Sure. But, and you can work through that grief, but work through it with God. And make sure that you acknowledge that this was what he wanted. I know that sounds crazy to some people, but it's absolutely true. Nothing happens without his knowledge and without his or, ordaining it be so. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, th that that's the case. I want to review some of the facts of what took place uh, over the weekend. I've got some statistics, and then hopefully we can begin a, d a productive discussion. You're, you're welcome to call or text at any point in this. We'd love to hear from you, 440-546-2255. I looked up a number of different analyses, and there were lots because Ohio was— Arguably the most watched state in the country. Yeah, for this election. So here's what we have. I found a piece from Washington Post that seemed to be uh, the most interesting. Ohioans voted to enshrine abortion rights, they say, in the state constitution Tuesday. Another sweeping repudiation of efforts to curb reproductive rights in a contest that was the most closely watched referendum in the country this year. Uh, and the amendment ba battle garnered, they said, intense national interest as a potential bellwether issue for the 2024 election, with millions of dollars from deep-pocketed billionaires and national special interest groups flowing into the state. Right. Both sides spent about $20 million. Yeah, that's when you 
kind of wish you weren't a non-commercial radio station because <laughs> we all could have had significant raises <laughs> with that kind of money. I also, I personally have a problem with other people from other states flooding their money into politics in our state. Like, I feel like there should be some sort of legislation against that. Mm. Yeah, no, I and a lot of people feel that way, I think. Yeah. And yet both sides did it, so we can't point any fingers. Mm-hmm. $20 million. And if you watch any local television or drive any car anywhere in Ohio, <laughs> you'd go, yeah, that sounds about right. I, was, I started getting ads on YouTube. I think those were the most annoying. Oh, goodness. Now, uh, they go on to say in this piece, a clear majority of Ohio voters said they felt dissatisfied or angry about the landmark Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in June of 2022, as opposed to feeling satisfied or enthusiastic. Okay. So polling data included, uh, after Dobbs, and the over- overturning of Roe v. Wade, a clear majority of Ohio voters feeling dissatisfied or angry about the decision. Hmm. So again, if you've been watching these statistics, you wouldn't be at all surprised about the outcome of the, of the election. Right. Is that extreme to say that, Ron, or would you, would you agree with that? No, it's not extreme. I, I would agree. The, the option on how you, you hope for it to go against the will of the majority is to have more of people with your viewpoint turn out to vote. Yeah. That's how you get past it. But and, and this time, I, I did look it up. There were 3.9 million Ohioans that voted mm-hmm. in this election, which is a very high turnout for an off presidential year. Right. 800,000 more people voted than back in August in the special election. Hmm. But it's still very low turnout. I mean, there's about 2 million people in the Cleveland metro area. So 3.9 total is still a pretty dismal response from right. citizens. But nonetheless, it is what it is. Now, um, Washington, Washington Post goes on to say abortion is currently legal up to 22 weeks of pregnancy in Ohio. But proponents pushed a massive signature drive to get an amendment on the November ballot after a ban on the procedure after six weeks of pregnancy went into effect last year, causing patients to flee to other states to be treated. The six-week ban was being litigated in court, but loomed large in the minds of many voters. That's the heartbeat, Bill. And that, what they're saying is, those who would have been yes proponents in issue one, that was really freaking them out. Hmm. It galvanized that group of voters. Uh, It goes on to say that Attorney General Dave Yost said in in an interview that the passage of the amendment uh, uh, opposed uh, would—it would prompt reflection and recalibration among those who were uh, no voters, people who were against the idea of abortion in the state constitution. Asked where Ohio's right to life movement goes after the defeat at the ballot box, Yost said, it's a great question. There's no blueprint. This is an existential fight. But the defeat is likely to prompt more soul searching from anti-abortion movements. Even, and I would say pro-life movements, even as some abortion opponents are arguing that the movement coalesce around a push for a 15-week federal abortion ban. Others are arguing that they need to be more pragmatic about supporting exceptions for rape, incest, and the health of the mother and do a better job of explaining government programs backed by the GOP that support mothers and babies. In recent weeks, Governor DeWine had tried to appeal to centrist voters by suggesting that the Ohio legislature revisit the wording of the state's six-week ban for the abortion, uh, if the abortion amendment failed, which, by the way, it did. Uh, He said, adding exceptions for cases of rape and incest. Because if you're familiar with that that heartbeat bill that Mm -hmm. passed, there were no exceptions for rape and incest. Which, by the way, that galvanized critics. Yes, it did. There were a lot of people who heard the ads that were geared toward those points, and it really stuck to them. They're like, really? Rape and incest? And you would make that child have a child? Or that woman, if if she's older? But... So I think, generally speaking... Lament is appropriate if you were, if you're someone who values unborn life. Mm -hmm. And yet I think there's a lot of other questions moving forward now that the Washington Post asked Attorney General Yost and Governor DeWine. 
Like, and they're both kind of going, I don't know where we go, but maybe less extreme is what DeWine was saying. Mm-hmm. I really like those texts that we got in. This outcome gives us a wake-up call to quit trying to legislate morality, but actually put legs on it. To love people, to help provide for them, to help women feel they are capable of carrying a pregnancy forward because we are loving and supporting them. Mm. Amen. What say you? we got to take a break, but uh, we'd love to hear from you. 440-546-2255. 722 now in WCRF. 440-546-2255. Uh, since we had a campaign the last few days, we didn't have much chance to digest uh, the recent election. Mm. Again, we're not interested in partisan politics, but I think we can certainly have a discussion about what took place, particularly with issue one and issue two, and then where, as followers of Christ, we ought to look in the days ahead. Uh, we've got a lot of people who want to weigh in here. Let's go to first, let's go to Eve. Eve, uh, what would you like to say here? Eve, are you with us? Yes, here I am. Hi, Hi Eve. Hi, Eve. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Yes. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Okay, so um, I just heard that uh, at the beginning it was stated that, you know, uh, that I do agree with what you said, that God didn't say, oh, I forgot about that. However, while God is omniscient, I don't believe that this passage of this abortion issue was ordained. Um I believe that negative things happen. Um, my youngest daughter believes that every negative event is a part of God's will. She blankets everything, and I disagree with that. There are three factors that bring about negative events in our world, as you well know. We live in a fallen world. Satan has been allowed to roam the earth, while God has the Holy Spirit who reigns, and sin nature. So while God knew this was going to happen, I don't believe that this was his will. And now it's up to us to turn it around. It's a spiritual warfare, and we have the victory. But God has allowed Satan to roam the earth, and he is very active while the Holy Spirit reigns. And so this spiritual warfare is what brings about these negative events, such as divorce, death of a child, um, things of that nature. Mm. Yeah, and you know, uh, you're you're bringing up a point where there certainly is disagreement among Christians on how to define and put parameters around God's sovereignty. Uh, yes. In fact, when I, was a, when I was much younger and new in my faith, I had a friend, I, I was reading through a Letters from a Skeptic, a famous book back in the 90s and 80s, uh, and the guy who wrote that book ends up leaning on the side of something called open theism. And I talked to a friend because it didn't feel right to me, and he was like, yeah, no, that would be considered a non-traditional view. And, his, and open theism is the idea that God can know everything but chooses not to know some things. Hmm. And I'm not in that category. And so I would be more even the category of whether it makes me uncomfortable or not. God is sovereign, and that is over everything. Like, I can't limit it and go, well, it wasn't his will, but it happened anyway. Uh, How is something that he allows to happen not his will? Wouldn't that be his will inherently if he allows it to happen because he's sovereign? I think it goes under the category of him being omniscient, all-knowing. He's aware of the of the uh, negative force, Satan's influence in nature, free will, and fallen world that influences um, our pursuits. And he's aware of the spiritual warfare, which won't be uh, calibrated until Jesus returns and sets up a new new world. Yeah, and I would just view it differently, Eve. God, God bless you. Um, the way that I would view it is the way my, my mentor uh, would has, has helped me think through this. It's like when bad things happen in my life, the question is not, why would you do this to me, Lord? Didn't you know that I'm a good Christian and you shouldn't hurt me? Hmm. The question becomes, what's God's invitation for me in this? Yeah. What is he asking me to do to grow and change? It sounds to me more more like you're saying, he didn't mean for this to happen, so we should change it. My question would be, what's his invitation for followers of Christ in Ohio? What's he asking us to do? I think he's allowed this to happen. He allows it to happen so that when it is remedied by his hand, God gets the glory. And I think he he gets the glory no matter what. And that's where I'm, you know, we, we could probably go in circles in this all day, but I have a hard time seeing how something that he allows to happen isn't his will. Do you see? Yeah. If he allows it, he was in control of it happening. Therefore, he meant for it to happen. But this is high-level theological stuff that I'd encourage you 
to go talk to your pastor about. At the end of the day, whether you think he's in control of it or he allowed it to happen, it still happened. Right. And we have to deal with it now. Exactly. Um, so, uh, 440-546-2255. What else have we seen coming in by text here, Daria? What's some you could share with us? Um, we've got some people saying they don't understand um, how abortion could even be allowed through uh, in cases of rape and incest. Um, someone else said, this is a really interesting comment, they think that the problem is that we need to legislate people having unprotected sex so that this isn't an issue in the first place. So, wow. Wow, wait, okay, so someone thinks that you can pass a law that says you can't have sex outside of marriage, and if you do, what, will arrest you? But you'd have to ask them. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think if you look at statistics and you watch what's taken place over the last number of months and years, it should come as no surprise that Christians are a minority. Mm -hmm. Like we have, there's people of great influence in the Christian faith today who said years ago we lost the culture wars mm -hmm. because we no longer are a majority in the, of the population, which is absolutely true when you look at statistics. Mm -hmm. Right. So in some sense, why are we continually surprised when nonbelievers do things that are unbiblical? Yeah, everyone, uh, you know, not everyone, sorry. A lot of Christians are like, well, they just need to do what the Bible says. They need to do what God wants. Well, a lot of people, majority of people don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe right. what God what God says and what God wants them to do. So it's your job, one, to love them, and two, to tell them about the great things God has done in your life so that we can win them over for Christ. And mm -hmm. then you can get into, okay, there are reasons. God's not just a killjoy. There are reasons he has prescribed that we abide by a certain lifestyle because um, sociologists and doctors in a lot of cases actually do recognize that having a lot of promiscuous sex is not good for your mental health and it's not good for your physical health. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to pursue a legislative uh, tact toward uh, reducing that un unprotected sex, you institute a law that says the, the father, the biological father, if, you know, paternal tests prove it, he is responsible financially for that child. And so many of these, these um, sperm donors are not interested in being a father at all. And so you, you put that kind of burden on them legally where you can latch on to their paycheck and take what you need for the, the monthly payments. They'll suddenly decide, oh, maybe I can be a little more responsible yeah, I, I think we just we need to have a little bit more compassion for these women too. like, I mean, first of all, the narrative has been for so long that a, a lot of people like we believe it's a baby. We believe that's a life. So many people, because of the way the narrative and the media have framed it, literally don't believe that a baby is a life. They don't understand that it doesn't just look like a blob. They don't understand that it can right. feel pain. So you got to understand they're coming from a place of ignorance. They're not evil. They're also scared. Like, so mm -hmm. I am, I am fully pro-life. However, if I found myself in a circumstance, uh, the economy is really rough where I was pregnant. I didn't know what to do. I can't promise you I wouldn't at least consider it because that is a terrifying, I'm sure, place to be in. Right. And at, at, before we get to a break, I think at, at the end of the day as well, this uh, God's invitation may, may be multiple things in in the wake of the election, but I think one of them would be what what's our goal? Is our goal to compel people to act like Christians, even if they aren't, to force people to subscribe to Christian morals, or is the goal for them to be introduced to Jesus and get saved? What's the goal? Yeah, that that changes your perspective. I think for a lot of us as Christians, we've lost sight of the idea that really at the end of the day, the goal is that more would be saved, that they'd be introduced to the good news of Jesus Christ. And as, as Daria clearly indicated, that their behavior would come in line once they know Jesus as their Savior. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are expending a lot of energy trying to compel others to behave the way the Bible says they should, even if they reject the Bible as a source of truth. Maybe it's time for us to really examine what our goal is here. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. 440-546-2255. We'll continue in just a minute. 738 on WCRF Mornings with Brian. Uh, the big talk of the country has been the state of Ohio. 
Uh, and so we're spending some time today in a follow-up Friday after a two-day campaign, which, by the way, thank you to all of you who participated in that. 27,000 Bibles across the country through Moody Radio are now going to be distributed across the globe. Thanks to your generosity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, we've been kind of digesting issue one uh, mm-hmm. a little bit here. We had a little discussion about God's sovereignty, but I don't think that's the most productive use of our use of our time today. I want to kind no. of focus more on issue one. Um, some information we haven't shared yet. When you look at the statistics, um, one, the, the New York Times reported early on that it was about 56 to 43 yeses had it statewide. Mm-hmm. 56%, which is a decisive victory for the yeses. Mm-hmm. But when you break it down by county, there were actually landslide victories for yes. Right. Issue one. As in Franklin County, 73% of the vote was yes. That's Columbus and Ca- the surrounding area. Cuyahoga County, 74% yes. Cleveland. Hamilton County, 65% yes. Cincinnati. Summit County, 65% yes. Akron. Lucas County, 64 Toledo. Lorraine County, 62. You see, Portage mm-hmm. County, 61. I mean, those are essentially decisively slash landslide victories. Mm-hmm. So the reality is, is that most of the metropolitan areas, which is, by the way, the majority of the population, voted in favor of this. Whether, whether you as a follower of Christ like it or not, that's the challenge. Now, you can look at counties, if you look at a map that looks at where the yeses and nos were, Land-wise, it appears as if most of Ohio was a no vote. Right. But the land areas where the no votes won, some of them even in a landslide, like, for example, uh, Shelby Shelby County, which I don't—do you know where that is? Shelby County? No, not offhand. Uh, 76% no won. But that's only 17,000 people in that county. And then there's Auglaize County? Mm-hmm. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah. 73% no, 27% yes, only 17,000 people. Franklin County, by the way, the 73% yes vote, Mm -hmm. 414,000 people. So land doesn't equal people either. Now, this is just the results. This is not me feeling, telling any feelings about it. But the reality is whether we like it or not, the vast majority of Ohioans seem to be in favor of issue one in the Constitution. So I want to think more about, like, where are we headed? Like, what's God's invitation here? What's next Mm -hmm. as followers of Christ? I've heard some already imply it's double down, fight harder. Right. Politically speaking, politically speaking. Mm Mm-hmm. What's that you? 440-546-2255. Let's go to Michelle in Cleveland. Michelle, what would you like to add to this? You know, uh, I've been listening to women in hair shop, and you get to hear a lot of stories about uh, legislating, um, men legislating about women should what women should do. Um, you shouldn't have, uh, uh, you, you should not be allowed to have an abortion. And they're saying that uh, you want women to have these babies but when they have the babies, you don't want to help them. And I, these are people who were Christians, and I was shocked. But, you know, what shocked me the most is even in my own heart uh, that we are not showing enough compassion um, because actually in these women's instances, these are people who have had – children out of wedlock. Granted, they may have gotten married later, but uh, when we don't show compassion, um, maybe their parents did and helped them along, but the state is not willing to help. Uh, And if we're not as believers willing to be compassionate to the women and help them along the way without condemnation, uh, and help them along the way for many, many years, uh, then they're going to have this mindset that nobody is going to help me and this is my only alternative uh, because then this is the route they're going to continue to take. Uh, because what else would they do? They're going to be embarrassed. They're going to be impoverished. They're going to have no way out. Uh, and it, it's just 
a horrible way to 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 want to live. So, um, well, you know, no one to help just to you. jump in here, Michelle, uh, you're making some excellent points, and um, as we look at what's next, right, for people who who value protecting unborn life, like what's next in Ohio? What's the the next move? Some somebody was implying earlier it's double down politically and fight harder. What's what's your take on what followers of Christ ought to do? It's a big I question. Sorry. To, <laughs> I, I I think we need to open up some homes and open up our pockets. <laughs> we open up our pockets for Bibles for people mm-hmm. to read, but we need to open up not only those Bibles, but some homes to help um women who find themselves um pregnant and a place to go to be able to have their children, to teach them how to, to, to be able to live mm-hmm. um, and teach them how to live like Laura's home, but maybe not in a, a huge place, but maybe a place where, you know, there's, uh, you know, two or three women and someone to help you to manage and to learn how to uh, live um, and work and, and play with your child and sure. live in a community. Um, so for you, it's kind of a shift a in focus towards a care for pregnant women, as we're already doing, but maybe double down on that as opposed to the political I route. So. I think so. Okay. Th- thank mm-hmm. you, Michelle. I appreciate your, your perspective on that. Because he- here's one of the more d- difficult intellectual exercises to do. It would be, what would it take for someone to change your mind on issue one? And I would mm-hmm. venture to guess most people listening to this right now, they would say, nothing will change my mind on that. Nothing. Right? Yeah. Nothing will change my mind. Okay, the, uh, those who disagree with you would say the same thing. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to, what, what good will you do forcing them to change their mind somehow legislatively? Like the real question mm-hmm. is how do you change people's hearts? Uh, we had one, one listener indicate, I think it was Tim who said this. He said, um, as Christians, we have to remember that theological debate is not going to end abortion. Banning abortion is not going to end abortion. Yeah, he's right. I wonder what God's invitation is now. Hmm. 440-546-2255. We'll keep talking in just a minute. WCRF, 65 years of ministry here in Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Praise the Lord and thank you for that as you've supported us through all these years. It's 751. We're as a just as a Christian family here, digesting the results of the election, right. uh, where issue one, a decisive victory for yes votes and emboldening them and ultimately putting abortion into the Constitution of the state of Ohio. But rather than just spend a lot of time complaining, I think it'd be helpful for us to try to have some productive forward thinking discussions. And I asked the team this off the air because I, I need you to work with me here and extend some grace as I ask kind of a hard question. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's a lot of followers of Jesus who have a one track mind on this. Yeah. So it seems. Now, I love when my mentor looks at me in the midst of difficulty and says, what's God's invitation in this? As in God is in full control. Maybe he's asking you to do something here or learn something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Let me ask a few questions here. No, again, I we at Moody Radio value life womb to tomb the end. God knit us together in our mother's wombs. It's clear in the scripture. Okay, so that aside, is the goal to save all unborn lives or as many as possible? In a society in which clearly the majority of Ohioans support abortion, mm-hmm. which is the best goal, you know? Is it to save all unborn lives or as many as possible? And if it's as many as possible, what if compromise or shift in strategy would become the best way to save the most lives. If you're pursuing the political route, legislative route, yeah. Yeah, or even really, when I say shift strategy, it might even be going, eh, politics won't work. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds dramatic for some people, but when you're in the minority in a culture, expecting politics to bend your direction is just, I'm not sure that's realistic. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying give up. Didn't say that. But what if we could save more lives by totally shifting our focus? What if God's invitation is, I want you to save more babies than you're saving now? Because, by the way, abortion went up in America after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Yes. Now, what does that look like? I don't have all the answers. 
I'm just saying maybe we shift. Maybe compromise. I know I don't like compromise sometimes. It's hard. Yeah, we don't want to compromise on our stance for life. Like, we're not going to do that. But right. when it comes to legislation, I mean, I think the reason issue one, which is, you know, abortion through all nine months of pregnancy, the reason that was allowed to come up was because we had one of the most um, restrictive abortion policies in the country, six weeks. That, that With is, no exceptions for anything. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I think maybe had it been back to 20 weeks, like it had been a couple years ago, this might not have happened. And then, yes, abortion is still legal, but it's only legal to a certain point. Now mm-hmm. a mother can decide to terminate her pregnancy at any point. And now, so just as a throw it out there example, okay, there are countries in Europe where they have more restrictive abortion laws than we do. Mm-hmm. But they get away with it for a very uncomfortable reason. They get away with it because they can look at someone who wants an abortion. I think some of them ban it at 15 weeks. Because they say, listen, you don't have to be concerned because we have robust programs available for you. The government will give you a year off as a mother, paid. Like they have robust programs for women and children to the point that they could go, why would you abort your baby? What are you thinking? We right. got you. But Taking whenever the crisis out of crisis pregnancy. Right. And so, but whenever I bring up that idea, Somebody who would be a social conservative and an economic conservative, suddenly it's a bridge too far. Right. Because then how do you pay for that? More taxes, which is money out of my wallet. I don't love babies that much, apparently. Right. Like if the goal really is to save as many as possible, what if it meant mm-hmm. Christians becoming strong advocates for maternity leave for all women in the country? I don't know. Do we love babies that much? I'm not saying that's the the answer. What I'm saying is God's invitation to us might be to find a way to save as many babies as possible. Right. In a new way. I don't know. Throwing it out there. 440-546-2255. We've got Lindsay in Pennsylvania. Lindsay, what what would you like to add to this discussion? Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for taking my call. Um, So I just wanted to share that I do believe that there is support for these moms that don't really know what to do and feel alone. Um, I'm part of a ministry, it's called Embrace Grace, and it's been going on for like 12 years. It started out in Texas, and our church started doing it about three years ago. And what it is, it's it's a support program. Um, It's a 12-week course where we um, teach them about the Bible and teach them about Jesus' love for them. And then we also, um, at the end of the 12 weeks, we meet weekly, um, we give them a free baby shower. So how that works is our church, they go on the registry on Amazon typically, and they buy these women all the gifts, all the things that they need. And um, afterwards, they have a community of ladies that have been in their shoes before, myself included. I had um, my first child when I was 19, and I wish I would have had a support system like this. And then afterwards, there is um, Embrace Life, which is to dig more into the Bible, to learn more about um, what God says about you. And it's, it's a really amazing program, and I don't think many people know about it, but we partner with the Pregnancy Center, and it's just, it's incredible. That's beautiful. Uh, mm. and, and by the way, th- thank you for your transparency and sharing that you had that similar struggle. Uh, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying is perhaps we already have the solution in front of us to save as many babies as possible, and it's not doubling down politically, but doubling down in ministries like what you're discussing. And um, what they always say, they don't say um, pro-life, like our thing is pro-love, because it is to love these women through their pregnancy, but not only through their pregnancy, but afterwards as well. And it's just, it really is amazing. I would encourage anyone to check it out. Yeah, because, you know, the Washington Post reported, as I shared a few minutes ago, that both the yes and no sides prior to the election invested about $20 million into ad campaigns. I wonder what your ministry and others like it could do with $20 million. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of wow. money out there for people who value life. What if yes, we didn't pour it into commercials for political things? What if we actually poured it into the lives of women and children? Amen. And, you know, something that I learned throughout this process, and there's a training to do if you want to be a leader, is majority of abortions, they're from women that already have one child. So that just shows me that it's not that they don't love these children. It's that they feel like they truly do not have the support that they need. Mm. 
Yeah. Wow. And, and we've talked to women on the show who uh, went through the teenage pregnancy uh, or pregnancy without being married, and it's really, really hard. Would you say that's the case for you, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, 100%. Um, I'm now with my um, first daughter's um, father. We're now married. We've been married for 11 years. Um, but it was extremely difficult. I lost all of my friends during that time, and I wish that I would have had women that could just gather alongside of me and just be there for me. Um, yeah. it, it was a very hard thing. Um, we always say that our, our first daughter was our saving grace because she absolutely took us um, on a path that changed our lives. And um, I became a believer um, because of it. I wow. was a believer previously. And see, that's right to the point of what my mentor consistently asks me when difficulty comes is what's God's invitation for you in this? And God's yeah. invitation in your teenage pregnancy, ultimately, you, you took his invitation and you ended up getting saved. Uh, yeah, a absolutely. And, you know, I would have never expected that. A lot of people from high school would have never expected that. Um, but it, it truly has been an incredible, um, you know, start to our journey. And it, it really is cool. Yeah, and it's one of those hard things when you think about God's sovereignty and all that, where if you were to ask most parents, would you want your daughter to get pregnant out of wedlock? They'd say no. But if they go, well, what if that, what if they'll get saved because of it? Mm. Then what would you do? I, I'm not saying we can ever know those kind of things, but that's where we look for God's invitation. Lindsay, thank you for sharing not only your ministry work, but your, your personal story. God bless you, sister. Yes, you too. Thank you guys for all you do. You bet. It's now 8 o'clock. We'll take a break here in just a minute. And again, I appreciate so many of you being so gracious here. I just want to ask some hard questions about where we go now. In a state, the whole country watched, where the majority of citizens in the state, a clear majority, support abortion. What's God's invitation for us in this? How can we save as many babies as possible? What does that look like? 